We have a stream sickle. My phone keeps vibrating, telling me that we started streaming, but I already knew that. Thanks, <laughs> thanks phone. <laughs> you seem tired today. You should take a nap. <laughs> This is Plaid Magic, Episode 6, All the Guilds, Part 3. Uh, I am one of the hosts of this show, Mr. McCottman, and I am joined here by the other hosts, Crow13. Hello! And Uncle Istivan. Hi. Who's new to us. Um, and, uh, so... <laughs> yes! He <laughs> you... <laughs> You'll, you'll forgive us forgive us if we're all a little slap happy. <clears throat> We've been uh, fighting tech issues for a while. So. Yes, for like a week. <clears throat> a week and a day. Uh, <clears throat> so welcome. Um, this is, like I said, this is episode six. Um, we're going to be continuing our Follow the Guild series, uh, Guilds series, uh, in which we talk about uh, Magic the Gathering cube design with relation to hinting. Uh, towards uh, drafters, uh, hinting drafters towards card selection and what types of art archetypes are supported. Um, so, without further ado, I guess we'll we will hit it, and we're going to roll into the our plaid pack, which is our format of pick one, pack one. But uh, we're going to take three. Um, we have here, let's see, Micaeus. The Unhallowed. Uh, I didn't see these guys very well. Rise, Rise of, the of the Hobgoblins. Steve, why don't you read these out? Sure. Suture Priest. Wooded Foothills. Incinerate. Goblin Rabble Master. Ogre Battle Driver. Thrill Kill Assassin. Rimaz, King of Orescos. Lanoir Elves. Cloudfin Raptor. Oh, I always have a hard time seeing this one. Battle Screech. Fleshbag Marauder. Doomblade. And Sigil Captain. Alright. Top three picks, Andy. We've done that. We did this a week ago, guys. So, we're <laughs> phoning it in here. <laughs> you never know. They might be different. <laughs> I liked, your, I liked your argument last time around, Steve. <laughs> well, I'll go with safe picks. Uh, Doomblade, removal, bla uh, battle screecher, fun card, and um, Land of Royals. Lanowar? Really? really? Lanowar. <laughs> <laughs> um, pop a big ramp. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go. I, I, I generally not, don't take the open or safe picks, uh, but I will certainly. I'm gonna. I'm gonna grab a Doom Blade, and I love, love, love Battle Screech as a card. And I'm probably grabbing the Suture Priest because it is uh, killer um, with the nods. I mean, there there are actually a lot of cards in this pack that I I, I like quite a bit. So. Right, and uh, that that brings us to the the opposite of your your overall approach here. I tend to go for the the big defining. This is what I'm going to you know. I set a tone with my first picks. Uh, not to say I can't change in pack two, but you know, the the general idea is to set a set a tone for what I'm going to try for. Um, and honorable mention goes to Rise of the Hobgoblins. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, but uh, I, Micaeus is a large black creature, and I just kind of have to have a thing, as we discussed, for large black creatures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't make the joke again this time. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> um Sigil Captain, seriously, if that doesn't scream, make a deck out of me, I don't know what does. Yeah. Um, and I really, I really love the Ogre Battle Driver. Um, that guy just kind of 
gets my juices flowing for. <laughs> I'm, I really, I'm not, I'm not working towards that. Seriously. <clears throat> yeah. Well. <laughs> it's never meant to go that way. It's really never meant to go that way. So you just enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as mentioned not that long ago, there, for over half of this pack interacts nicely with Sigil Captain, right. somehow or other. Yeah, this, this looks nice. All right, well, uh, I think we're going to head into the uh, Fall of the Guilds section. This uh, week we're going to be discussing Celestia. Um, and uh, in preparation for this, we spend quite a bit of time reworking this section. It's part of why we do this series is so that we take time to focus on uh, on the different modules of our cube and, and ensure that we are we have some sort of justification for, for what we have in there so without further ado um, counters lords is uh, the, the archetype that we fully support in, uh, in the green light um, as we do with all of these follow the guild sections um, we're going to review the uh, Turns to win. Uh, the goal is six to nine, so there's actually a pretty high spread on this, but uh, um, there's quite a range. It's uh, going to got yeah, level of commitment um, that's in a cube that isn't ours. The level of commitment is is high. Um, to fully build this out with counters lords would be quite a task for a, a, a standard cube. Uh, draft priority and order is going to be counters lords. These are actually not in order, I believe. I don't know. No, I don't think they're order. necessarily in order, no. Right, so it's a misnomer. Um, uh, ETB and self counter cards. Uh, Enter the battlefield. Counter booms. So I think we're all familiar with the terminology. Get into that later. All right, we're hopping over to the counters lords section. So this is one piece of the puzzle that makes uh, Counters Lords support it as an, as an archetype. Uh, I'll just give a few examples. We've got Elite Scale Guard, Anna Bonkin, and Bramble and Paragon. Uh, Andy, if you were to talk about one of these as being something that uh, is useful to discuss from an archetype standpoint of supporting this type of build, uh, which one would you pick? Well, I think Elite Scale Guard's the most interesting because I think you could possibly put that into any cube and be fine. You don't really have to work out for it just because of it has everything built into one package. Okay. Uh, other than that, just it's nice because in our cube we didn't really have to. We just add had to add the Counter Lords to make it work. We didn't necessarily have to do anything else to incorporate this into our cube. Dan, we have a request for you to turn your volume up just a little. Talk real loud. There's no. There's this. Um, I'm gonna skip to the next slide, uh, Andy. If you want to, if you want to work on that. Um, Self counters that we have here as examples: the Dead Protector, Strangle Geist, and Cloud Goat Ranger. And I'm going to work on my microphone. Yeah. So essentially, when you have <clears throat> when you're building out this archetype, what you want to have is, is essentially a a grouping of cards that will automatically have counters on them. It's pretty important to have as many of these as you can, just because relying on other cards to put counters on your creatures can be somewhat annoying. Um, so with the card selection that we had here, we have Dem Protector, which obviously has the Metagamorph uh, added to it, and this was a nice card because it 
just as a fairly efficient card. Strangle Group Geist, the same thing. Cloud Goat Ranger is here mainly because, as you'll see in the next slide, we start moving over into what we call the boons. Um, they typically help you out uh, by going a little bit wider and adding uh, counters on all the creatures that are in the battlefield. Uh, you know, just having a creature that puts in tokens and plates is beneficial rather than having a spell is mainly because you have another target that comes into play. Um, then we have Stand, Step, Outcast. This card kind of encompasses all of what you need to do depending on what you have in your hand. So let's say you have a boon in your hand, well then you're going to do what you normally do, which is put a token into play. But if you don't, and you are trying to you know, get to a certain threshold with plus one plus one counters, this helps you out uh, and provides a little bit, provides you with a way of having a creature with counters on it without taking a huge hit on efficiency. Um, again, this, the whole point of this ETB self counters is that they provide you with cards that are efficient that you would normally put in any archetype, but because of the fact that they have counters on them, or provide you with a means to, you know, get your threshold of creatures on the board. Uh, it provides a more efficient deck, so that you're not completely just uh, relying on the fact that oh, I need to draft counter lords, or I need counter lords to be in play for your deck to work. These cards are efficient enough in themselves. Right. Yeah, I, I Grease that. in the wheels. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I Counter boons section. Um, most of these cards have the word boon in it, so that's why they're in this section. Uh, we've got nope. <laughs> Titania's Boon, Gavany Township, and Meadow Boon. <laughs> so, um, obviously, recurring boon is a big deal, and we've got you know the the Johnny package for for recurring boon. We've got Macias um, Macias the Lunark. Um, but uh, these aren't. Uh, these Titania's boon uh, isn't, uh, and Meta boon aren't. Uh, leaves playing, yeah, sure. They could be combat tricks. Uh, Titania's boon is not a combat trick, but uh, we needed some extra spell-ish effects um, in here. So Titania's boon is actually the only card we added for this for the boon effects. So we, I, I think, we we're pretty well supported overall. Right. I, again, we started with what was there and moved to a direction that worked with the archetype. Obviously, with um, the cons block coming out, it made it an archetype out of what was there a little bit more feasible to do. So we moved towards that direction, and I think it's going to work out a lot better. The, the boons in general are nice because, again... They don't rely on them to be good. Like they don't rely on you to have counter lords out and play for them to be good. They're good on themselves. Gavney Township's always been a really good card. Uh, Meta Boon's always been a really good card. And Tatania's Boon, I have a feeling that's probably one of the new cards Flonase, that might eventually come spray. out. But now available. Really, you're with these cards. This is your strategy where you want to go a little bit more wide. And these and other cards that we have in our cube uh, really benefit from doing that. Right. I think it's also important to note that... Uh, um, so we've gone through the three sections here. Um, that's more or less... Um, those are examples. Some of those are additions. Um, but all of the additions that we put in to support this archetype were in the monocolored sections. Um, so we, we first look at that 
we look at what's there, what's supported and or supportable and fun and draftable, uh, and then and then we'll move into it. So even this is a so so this the the name of this cast. So this is the follow the guilds segment of our of our uh, podcast series. Um, we did not start with uh, the multicolor uh, section and work our way down. We looked at what was there in the monocolor section and then built it up. So now uh, there might be a swap or two in the in the the gold section, but that's that's step two. Right, right Andy. Correct. <laughs> You don't have to ask me. <laughs> I, we've had this discussion before. I was just looking for, you know, uh, sometimes I say things that are incorrect. I uh, So we were going to actually drop one of these. We're moving into the Never Been Planned section for uh, those of you who are new to our cast. Uh, that is the section where we go through and find a card that's never been played, and we remove it. Uh, Plaid. Plaid. Steve has a list, I think, of about 360 cards that he would like. To <laughs> <play>. <laughs> it's not 360. It might be 260. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. This is a good section. This, 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 this section will get a lot of play in my house. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. So. <laughs> We were going oh, to yeah. cut this, this section short. I actually just basically didn't do it before we got on the cast here uh, due to time constraints. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna zip through it, and I am going to. We're not gonna talk about my picks because I'm dropping both my picks. And I'm just gonna give one pick, um, which is not on this slide. So you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Bell Shepherd. All right. Corpse Dance. Go ahead, Andy. Just a few. All right, you're going to go through all of them, right? Oh, yep, yeah, sorry, I'm going to spill them out on the, on the page here. Um, ignore the, the bottom row. <laughs> we have uh, Fell Shepherd, Corpse Dance, uh, Doomed Necromancer, Miraculous Recovery, Liliana, well, no, we're going to ignore the bottom row. I'll give you my surprise swap here. <laughs> all right. Okay, so... Fowl's Shepherd. Essentially, when you're looking at Hell's Caretaker, what this typically is run in is the Azorius deck. This can be run in other decks, but it was primarily the thought process was the Azorius deck tends to be the best fit for it. Um, and the issue with Hell's Caretaker is that it really just is too slow. Uh, also, the fact that you can only do it during your upkeep just prevents it from doing it any sort of combat tricks. So I was trying to look at that same theme with some of my picks. Did you say Azorius? Uh, or Azov, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Yep. Just, uh, just making sure. <clears throat> so when we're looking at the... My first card, one of the things I thought that Orzov had an issue with is that it didn't really have enough bombs. Um, just cards that finished off the game quickly if they did, weren't dealt with. And Foul Shepherd kind of fits that role of Hell's Caretaker and uh, an adding another bomb into black. So this card provides some pretty cool combat tricks. If you look at what... Uh, Azorius and Demir are doing. A lot of them have to deal with ETB creatures and efficient creatures costs. Um, and this kind of plays into those cards that are already existing into those two colors because of the um, blink deck that exists there and then the tempo based strategy that exists. And we can, you can definitely go off with this card. On top of that, it adds another slight uh, mass removal with the sacrifice outlets. Um, putting minus two minus two on a creature is most certainly going to add this card to win most combats or remove, you know, chump blockers. And as soon as it hits in, you just get all those ETB creatures back in your hand. 
So I thought this was an interesting pick. The mana cost might be a little bit too prohibiting, but it definitely seemed interesting to me. Um, then for Corpse Dance, this card seemed like the best replacement if you're trying to go with a, like a the combat tricks right a combat trick but you know being able to have it a recurring but not have it so susceptible to removal mm -hmm. um, I thought this card was a fairly good replacement to health caretaker if you want to keep that same type of effect that's it for me all right, well, um, the Doomed Necromancer to me seemed literally, you know, if, if the, the issue with Hell's Caretaker was that you you kind of wanted something, something creature-based, you kind of wanted some sort of um, permanent-based um, effect, uh, the Doomed Necromancer gives you that effect in a much more efficient uh, I mean when I say efficient obviously it, it doesn't recur over multiple turns but how many how many things are you going to get out of Hell's Caretaker before somebody realizes I got to get rid of that thing anyway Nobody so use yeah there's I mean that's that is that is the huge <laughs> issue you know the the doom necromancer you're gonna be like when can I use it when can I use it like oh now now I can use it you know and it's and it just works you know it it doesn't have the weird timing of the hell's caretaker and it's cheaper it's faster it's slightly more likely to make it sit around for a while if you really needed it to um, so it just it just kind of was was what looked like needed to be um, the literal replacement for hell's caretaker I in terms of, you know, I, I kind of looked at something similar to the corpse dance in terms of a, a non-permanent, hard to hard to get around effect uh, with the mir miraculous recovery. On top of that, the miraculous recovery, you know, it has the combat trick aspect and it has the plus one plus one counter. So it just felt like it fit the theme, even if it didn't fit the color. Um, I still like it, but <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a place for it. I think. I mean, it's certainly not outside it won't replace Hell's Caretaker uh, necessarily, right. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see this in the queue uh, sometime very soon. Okay, my pick. Forget those guys. <laughs> so, just a precursor. All of us, the three of us, had been on a conference call. We spoke about this swap uh, at like, and, and when we had all sort of stated that probably a living death or a living end would actually be a pretty cool replacement for this. And then we all secretly pick our swaps and then <laughs> we come together on this broadcast and nobody has picked either of those two cards so the argument against living end so the cool thing about living end is that like it's this weird build up interaction like that fun run up to uh, since you don't have cascade you're running up to um, a, a, a position so you're, you're fighting your opponent hopefully if you have living end in your deck you are going to come out on top of that uh time fight, right? You're going to, each turn, you're going to be working towards that, and you have built your deck in a certain way. Your opponent still has the ability to react. So the counter-argument that Andy had made, uh, which was a great counter-argument, is that, yeah, that's fine, but without Cascade, you know, it sucks, is after you remove the last counter, uh, it gets countered. So, that's still a valid argument. And so we, we talked about Living Death in the end. Um, the question is, is this a better solution? Um, All Hallows Eve, you guys can spin up Gatherer. Ooh. You like. Ooh. That, that's a blast from the past. Mm -hmm. All right. Why don't you read off the card, Dan? All right. It has totally irrelevant counters on them, but... Um, is two black, two for a sorcery. Uh, exile All Hallows Eve with two scream counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, if All Hallows Eve is exiled with a scream counter on it, remove a scream counter from it. If there are no more scream counters on it, 
put it into your graveyard, and each player returns all creature cards from his or her graveyard to the battlefield. So it's half. It is uh, of... suspend before suspend was there. Right. But does not count as a spell second time around. It is placed in your graveyard. Uh, it, it becomes a sorcery again, but it's not being cast at that moment. Right. So it's sort of the two, you know. It's a mishmash between. It's a, huh. I thought it was a neat card uh, to consider for this type of role. Um, I think a lot of and a lot of the uh, old school players might enjoy casting this at some point. Absolutely. Uh, um. The thing that's that sort of huh. sucks is that it has the word counter on it, but it's totally like it's not a suspend counter. <laughs> it's not anything. It doesn't mean anything except for it has the word counter. So. Yeah, but there's scream counters. That is relevant. Yes. <laughs> I believe that there's something that I, I think Watsi was saying something about that they were going to have some some cards in Origins that interact with scream counters. Oh really? No. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Really? <laughs> so, um, All Hallows pick is All Hallows, All Hallows Eve is a cool pick. All right. So, just ran across it in the binder, and I said, "Hey, hey, hey, Let's hey, hey." Guy out. Yeah. Anywho, um, so um, uh, my vote is on All Hallows Eve because we were talking about that type of archetype and, and, and that type of mechanic and getting it into the cube. Um, I feel like this is, um, uh, you know, this is some sort of of compromise between the two cards we were looking at to fill the slot. So that's why I threw it up there. Yeah, my light's cool. cool. Yeah, I like it. It, so they, and it still gives you that that yeah that that interesting period of how fast can I fill my graveyard? Yeah, the only issue I have with it is because Orzov tends to be a control deck. Not that this is the only deck that it's going to be played in, but um, keeping in that mindset, uh, typically what you're doing is doing, um, you know destroying their early drops and killing them and then you lay down your bomb uh, the right. thing I liked right. about the thing I had an issue with I mean the thing I liked about the most with living death and living end was the fact that it also was a wrath effect on it the fact that it had the wrath effect you could at some point switch modes and decide okay I'm just going to um, let these creatures survive and start chump blocking. Now you can obviously start chump blocking, but it's more susceptible to not quite, you know, ending the game like it needs to be at some points. Not to say that this role <laughs> needs to be doing it, but it, uh, I mean, this is definitely a better card than Hell's Caretaker and does a more interesting effect. So. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's funny because when we were talking about um, uh, Living Death and Living End, I was thinking Orzov. Um, when I saw this card, I was thinking more something like Rakdos, like Suicide Rakdos. This is a card, a reanimation card that's that deck. Just funny because I think Demir. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking Demir as well. <laughs> I don't know. It, I mean, and it, could, it, it, could, it could get, yeah, it could really get used just about anywhere that anything that runs black just about yeah be fun to see a cast uh, we'll take it offline okay yep. so um, let's move into our next uh, card swap and I'm going to just remove that All Hallows Eve from here um, uh, we need to get rid of Terminus so there's no deck that we are aware of in our queue that wants Terminus um, Matter of fact, many of them actively hate it. Yeah. Even you know, even if you'd think, well, it's a white deck, and I could use a wrath effect, and you look at it and go, nope, not that one. Yeah, yeah, nothing in the graveyard, no fun. We 
we don't have a mill strategy, so <laughs> it's, it's yep. a counter mill or anything. So um, it was just really, I think it's a remnant probably from a while back when we um, took a template, swapped out a bunch of cards uh, to, for the Counters Matters theme. So there's just there's maybe just really a handful of cards that are left over from that. Uh, but uh, okay, so I'm going to throw them all out there. We have. I say them as I go. Faith's Reward, Austere Command, Martial Coup, Crime and Punishment, <laughs> Divine Reckoning, and Fell the Mighty. Uh, spoiler alert, last time we tried to do this cast, we picked Faith's Reward. So, <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to do this? <laughs> Over my objection. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's what happened here. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, Fate's Reward, uh, again, thinking of that same mindset <clears throat> of what cards, again, well, so again, Terminus is generally played in the Orzov deck. And thinking of that same mindset, I didn't think we necessarily needed another Wrath in White. But I thought doing something that had to affect with, you know, creatures ET being and whatnot, same thought process I was going in with the uh, Hell's Caretaker swap. Faith's Reward offers another way for you to do some combat tricks and gain some additional benefit from those ETB creatures. Uh, the command... <coughs> command is another thing where we don't typically like to put like artifact and enchantment removal so this offers another effect like that as well as also providing another another wrath but more looking at your board state and giving you a little bit more options for it because of that you're able to you know if you're a later part in the game which you generally are and you have a large your bomb out, then you can choose to decide which way to go. Or if you, they have a bomb out and you have some dirtily creatures out or no creatures out, and you just need to deal with the bomb so you can last a few more turns. It just gives you a lot more options. Right. Plus, it's a uh, it's white ramp if you've got a fetch in the yard. What? <laughs> if you've got a fetch land in your graveyard, it's a ramp. Oh, Fate's Reward? Yeah, Fate's Reward. Okay. Oh. I'm like, how does Command ramping you? <laughs> so, um, I, I can... I can definitely um, agree with everything that has been said about those two. Um, that said, I don't like the six cost on the Austere Command, personally. Yeah. Which is going to be funny considering um, what's coming up, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Mar Marshall Coup, one of my picks is uh, to to make the wrath effect go off. You're looking at seven, not six. But that said, it, it's more flexible um, and it it fits in different um, you know different types of the, such as the the. <sighs> Counter the decks, board. yeah, sure. the decks that want the the tokens are are gonna enjoy this regardless of whether you can manage to pull off the wrath effect. Um, the <laughs> crime and punishment, I'm not even gonna go into that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had I had this I had this kind of I had this greatest brilliant idea that I would just have like a flip and I'd, I'd slap a, a white card with the 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 black effect that you were replacing in the other one, and then I put this heavily black card in the, and yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <clears throat> um, I don't really want to discuss uh, mine too much. Probably out of the two, I feel like Divine Reckoning is better. However, uh, it's um, I think it's better if it doesn't have the flashback, honestly. But uh, yeah. Uh, that's where we're at. Uh, I'm 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 picking face reward out of these these uh, swaps. 
Me as well. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> yep, I know. I know what. <laughs> You've never been plaid, Steve. I never no. have. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we're going to hop into the mailbag section. One of our uh, um, one of our fans uh, has sent <laughs> a mailbag question here. Uh, it's a real person. Uh, a, a Plaid and Magic Cubers. Uh, I was going through your Cube Tutor blog for historical cuts and I noticed Mishra's Factory was cut back in November 2014. I think our Cube cubes are of a pretty similar power level, and the factory would be among the last of my cuts. How does your group feel about Manlands as a whole, and what led to the factory leaving the cube? Also, as a side question, I see you still have Mutavolt. Do you think that there are enough tribal effects in your cube to warrant its benefit over factories blocking as a 3-3? And for people making similar decisions of Mutavolt over Factory, what density of tribal effects do you think one would need? That's a big question for three people like us. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, should and we start guys, with the first one? <laughs> I do apologize because I'm, I'm sort of can. I mean, it's it's sort of hard for me to hear you because as you see, this microphone is very short. It is a uh, engineering failure, um, and so I have to move. <laughs> the speaker away from my ear so that people can hear me so <laughs> but go ahead I'm moving it back and forth as we go to question number one um, being uh, being a cuber um, I, I, I can tell you that I don't care about man lands a bit um, they as far as I'm concerned they are an afterthought at best um, and I, I know that's not true of other people, um, but I, I it, they don't. They certainly don't seem to have any relevance in this cube. I thought, I thought we agreed last time we were going to be gender neutral on the describing lands that we come. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <sighs> Thing lands. Thing lands. Yeah. <laughs> Person lands. Yes. Uh, now. <laughs> um, no, I agree. I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm even more ridiculous. I'm the same way with swords, and that's maybe why uh, I, I've never drafted. I don't even look at the swords. I don't know what they do. <laughs> I think they're, they're like equipment. I guess they're good. I've, I've had somebody attack me with one once. Um, they made a wolf, I think. Um, that's literally. I, I, I just have never ever drafted a, a sword, and I think that. Uh, we just didn't really go down the person land uh, uh, that route. We just didn't do it. Um, so right, that's it. I'm going all the way. The, I, I'm going all the way to the other extreme. Uh, woman lands. Yeah. Yeah, they're no. they're just they're. I don't. You know. Several podcasts. They they do that as an intentional effort. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. Um, but um, but no. I mean, it's not something we have really looked at. And uh, if you have gone over our queue, um, you'll notice we have a we have several things in there that are I feel are just cool like possible incidental um, fun interaction cards. So they're cards that just and 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 that's the name of the game I think for for the changeling type effect. Um, it's that incidental. Oh, do I have a shaman out in play? Um, those those types of things. Sorry, Andy. Uh, <laughs> bringing up shamans again. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but um, it's that type of stuff that 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 is really fun. And we're not looking to uh, pigeonhole. I mean, we've had a lot of uh, I, I, honestly over the last couple of weeks, I've had a lot of great feedback. Uh, if you if if you haven't been to the Riptide Lab forums. Um, which are sort of loosely or very tightly associated with Jason Waddell. I don't know exactly the relationship, but uh, um, if you haven't been there, check it out. I've gotten a lot of feedback from from uh, from the members there, and uh, um, you know, they're saying, "Oh, you know, why?" A lot of feedback like, "Why is this card in there? This doesn't seem to fit that strategy." And and the answer is that we're 
we honestly, we're a counters matters cube, but we leave a lot of room. So it, it is something that is incidentally, uh, it's something that you have to factor in when building a deck, because you know that it's there. So no matter what strategy you go, if you just draft good stuff, um, it's there, whether you're playing it or your opponent's playing it or uh, whatever, it, it, it is going to happen at some point that a counter will matter during our game, almost certainly. And so we enjoy, for the um, purpose of, of, of um, keeping our cube interesting, we, we I, at least I personally really enjoy the, that incidental fun stuff, and I feel like um, Mutavault fits that slot very well. It is a, it is a person land that um, has that opportunity. We didn't build it, we didn't throw it in there for something specific. There's no uh, fish deck, there's nothing like that, there's no elves or goblin support, but um, it's something that could come into play at some point. Uh, I'm going to convince you guys to do Illusion Tribal one of these days. I was thinking, uh, <laughs> w you know, now that, uh, you know, uh, that that is a thing that we have, like, things like, with sh you know, shapeshifters and things like that. We can mm. finally have, like, a, a Gelfling Skeksis, like, EDH <laughs> Tribal Showdown at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally Ooh, thinking about that. Pulling the dark yeah. crystal <laughs> reference. Nice. There's not a lot of people who feel safe doing that. Blowing the uh, dust off of that one. <laughs> 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 no, no, good call. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so the question is, uh, so if you're making an actual decision, if, if, if you have person lands uh, in your queue and you have... Um, um, Mutavault and Mishra's Factory. If, if you are supporting a tribal theme, you need to have much more tribal than what we have in our queue, because we basically have only incidental tribal, which is the level at which we find have found it to be interesting. Um, uh, and, and that's about it. If you, are, if you are fully supporting tribal, I would say that, you know, it, it's, it's very clear when you have enough tribal to choose a mutavault over uh, a factory. Uh, I don't find factory pers personally interesting, but I don't block, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's true, he doesn't. <laughs> His games tend to be very short. I don't draft swords and I don't block. <laughs> Do you think he doesn't know how to block? <laughs> <laughs> old school we didn't we didn't do it uh, there's no banding so i stopped blocking after being after the yeah yeah banding. it's really and now i have that, that was so I that don't was a shame it. <laughs> 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 it, was, it was a it was a crying shame that the day that i heard that they were no longer printing banding cards i i cried a little <laughs> steve <laughs> uncle is devon bands with skexy <laughs> 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 hey, uh, I'm the I'm the guy who has the legend lands that give legends yes. bands with other legends. <laughs> that's 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 me. A <laughs> uh, few points as far as just man lands in general. You know, I think I think Zendikar and how they did it when they had you know some of the bigger man lands, the dual lands. That was important to the set. It fit into the theme. I think for the most part, a lot of times, when you see them in cubes now, they typically are just thrown in as another creature. And then the upside of having a few more mana-fixing cards. The issue I find with it is that it depends. You really have to look at how interactive you want your cube to be. And the man lands really provide this, you know this hole where now how do how does your opponent deal with them they're not very interactive at all maybe it provides you choice because you have to decide if you want to leave it open for mana or if you need a block but for the most part they just kind of they seem like they're used a little bit more than they need to be used 
the other thing too to keep in mind in our cube we don't play any land destruction or very few if it has land destruction it's not really the reason why it's in the cube and we don't I don't think that having man lands typically pushes you more towards that direction and I think not having them allows you not to want to have to play ma uh, land destruction so it's please 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 no land destruction right <laughs> just, just nothing just nothing in that realm so i'm fine with man lands as long as they fit into something in some sort of theme in your queue but then that has to be you know to me i think that if it fits into it like zendikar you know added it to it then yeah, go for it. But otherwise, I think it's used a little bit too heavily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to drop in a celestial colony in our cube. It would just be, it'd just be terrible. But uh, um, I think it's like any other archetype. I mean, you just know if you have support for it. Um, I, I, I don't know where to give a number on something like this, but that's... Um, I think it's pretty clear. Some yeah, amount of really, tribal, literally, some just a matter of, of yeah. If your if your cube cares about tribal, then it will care about meat of all. Right. And if it if your cube does not specifically care about tribal, then meat of all is just another land. Right. Could be. All right. So we're uh, wrapping it up here, guys. Uh, we got some uh, shoutouts here. So first of all. Uh, Shout out to Commanders HQ on MTG Cast, their podcast. They broadcast. They also broadcast uh, from balmy St. Cloud, Minnesota, as as do we. Uh, <laughs> so all the big wigs come from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Super, super <laughs> important <clears throat> magic thing. <laughs> so, uh, so they actually they drafted our cube, forced us to do a ninety card extension, and uh, <laughs> and uh, the last time. Which. Which turned out to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that was super fun. Uh, Andy, I think you're going to have to do a cast on that sometime. I'll, I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember exactly. We, I just grabbed a bunch of cards I wanted to play with. Um, but, uh, uh, also, a shout out, obviously, to MTG, MTGcast.com. Um, we are... Um, uh, this is a Twitch cast, YouTube, uh, but we also extract the audio and export this to uh, mtgcast.com. There's a lot of MTG podcast providers there, so if you're looking to consume uh, magic content, I mean, there's several fantastic Cube podcasts that, that run out of there. So um, shout out to uh, Jason Waddell. Um, he has a ton of fantastic articles. Um, that uh, for me have been uh, game changers just like the the um, what was it the the poison principle I think was one of his yeah, uh, more yeah. popular articles fantastic yep. that was um, so really if you haven't read cool. that check that out and that'll lead you into some other stuff uh, and then on a similar note riptidelab.com uh, which I mentioned earlier it's a fantastic place for serious cube development and review um, and a shout out to our newest cast member Uncle Istiban fantastic show Steve thank you so much <laughs> that is, oh. well of course let it all out <laughs> yeah, yeah. alright so some, uh, some, plaid, some plaid news here um, which rhymes with bad news and I, that's not a coincidence uh, oh. So, uh, oh. uh, we will be starting probably in the near future a new uh, MTG cast podcast only series uh, audio, so we don't have to deal with all this weird uh, video stuff. Um, Plaid Magic, thinking inside the box. We're going to do some... Um, we're just going to talk Q. Uh, it's going to be less structured than, than these casts are, if you can imagine that. But uh, I, w was the intent here. It was to capture some of the in-between day-to-day cube management and, and, and discussion that's already happening uh, behind the scenes. So, Things like, hey guys, why aren't we using power conduit? Yeah. Get rid of Aetherling, it sucks because one time I died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, that, that card has never killed me. 
I have no. I, I, <laughs> my issue with Etherling is very different than that. Sure, sure. Because <laughs> what the hell is Ether? <laughs> <laughs> no, Flogist, uh, Flogiston. I can I can tell you what Ether is. <laughs> <laughs> An Etherling. Now that's just wrong. Just put you spray <clears throat> into like the like air intake of an engine. Yeah. To give it <laughs> I yeah, highly, highly flammable. In the winter, yeah. <laughs> All right, so our next cast um, will be uh, Thursday, June 18th at 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll be covering, we'll possibly be doing a Magic Origins review. Uh, we're actually recording this on, uh, on uh, May 28th, so my expectation is that we're going to get um, some spoilers over this uh, GP Vegas thing that's happening. I guess in Vegas, and uh, and and hopefully if, if we get a full spoil or enough of a of a spoiler that there's that there's some good cube uh, content uh, for us to review, we we may very well do that, uh, and we'll do our normal stuff: cube design, card swaps. I hope and Steve hopes more, and then uh, possibly a new segment. And until then, we may have in between now and then uh, our episode, flagship episode of uh, Thinking Inside the Box, so look out for that. Good well, stuff. I think that's the whole thing that we were going to do tonight. So, thank you all for joining. Andy, if you uh, had any uh, closing statements here for our viewers. Uh, uh, I can play the intro video and then you could talk over that. <laughs> Green water. Oh, that's pretty. Boy, I like it. It's alive with algae. <laughs> That's Flat Magic, and we're signing off. Have a good day or evening. Peace out.